In an effort to find the face of Christ in other people, one couple's journey began at home. We're talking about the challenges and blessings of marriage and family tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome our Father, Ms. Paco. Welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Uh, before we get to our guests, who haven't come from too far away in the world, actually, uh, we, we want to mention that today is also the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord. Uh, this is a great feast of the church in which we celebrate 40 days after Christmas. And in that the 40th day after Christmas, we celebrate that Mary and Joseph brought the child Jesus into the temple so that they could offer two turtle doves or a couple of young pigeons, uh, the offering of the poor. And they were also purified. Mary was uh, purified because uh, it's also called the Feast of the Purification because the process of birth is something that set women apart. Uh, birth is a holy process. And as such, it was considered a sacred state. And before being able to go back into the temple, a woman had to go through a purification at the mikvah or, or ritual bath. And then the offering would be made in the temple. In obedience to this law of God, Simeon and Anna come in led by the Spirit. And this is one of the great things about the feast. It's a combination of obeying the law and the action of the Holy Spirit. And the action of the Holy Spirit takes place in the context of obeying the law. And the great words of Simeon, now, Lord, you may dismiss your servant in peace according to your word, is lived out because he saw the Messiah and he was able to celebrate that, that great day in which he actually met the Messiah. Well, now we have some guests for tonight. And you may have seen them recently on e the network during our coverage of the March for Life. Or you might have seen any number of their short segments entitled Marriage and God's Plan. They've spoken to singles groups and married couples around the country. And now they're coming right to your home through their EWTN radio show, At Home with Jim and Joy. So please welcome Jim and Joy Pinto. Jim, welcome. Joy, good to have you. Good to be here. The reason I mentioned that you're not from too far away, where do y'all live? In Birmingham. Right here in Birmingham. So we didn't have to go too far around the world. As a matter of fact, uh, I want to thank you for pitching in at sort of a last minute because our scheduled guest couldn't get out because of all the snowstorms. Right. And so uh, we don't have any snow down here at this point, thanks be to God. And you're able to come and join us and tell us about your new radio show and some of the ministry that you're doing. So I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. It's always a great blessing uh, to be with you, Father, and to be on air with EWTN. And, you know, you just spoke about the Feast of the Presentation, and that's really so much of our heart and our show at Home with Jim and Joy every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. If we could just have parents who are loving one another, uh, like Mary and Joseph to some degree, bringing their children to the temple, bringing them before the Lord, it would transform the world. And that's, that's the hope for our show at Home with Jim and Joy, that we just offer a place where people can call in via the radio, feel at home. We encourage them as couples, as families, because as you know, the family is just under incredible attack. Life is under attack. And our show is a place where people can come and where, where you know, they hear the good news there, that life is sacred that marriage and family is God's plan to transform the world. Mm -hmm. So we just open it up, and Joy and I, the love of my life, field whatever question they might have. Speaking of love of your life, yes. I mean, this is not a new subject for you. How long have you two been married, Joy? 
A very short 33 years. 33 years. It went so fast. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we dated six years beforehand, so 39 years we've been together. Yeah. Well, that's a good long time. Yes. That's nice. And how many kids do you have? We have four wonderful children and 10 grandchildren. 10 grandchildren. That's mm -hmm. another good start. It mm -hmm. is. And because, more to come. You know, that's what I suspect from know, knowing your kids. Yeah. Uh, your, your kids seem to like having kids. We really encourage them. You know, yeah. this is a, a childless kind of culture, the culture of childlessness. And, and we've loved them and we speak to them about the beauty of having children. And they know that they're loved. And we say to them, hey, this is part of the calling. An important part of the calling in marriage is to welcome life. And you would think that would be understood, you know, quite easily. But in this culture welcoming a child is rare now right. and becoming less and less, even in the church. So we try to encourage them, and they're just beautiful children and wonderful grandchildren, and it's the best thing this side of heaven. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, it's a lot easier having grandkids than having kids. It is. <laughs> it really is. We enjoy when they it. start to leak, you can send them home. That's right. <laughs> well, and, and the, the beauty of it all is, you, you know, you get, to, you get to see yourself in another generation. It's like, oh, my goodness. And then the way that we poured our lives into our children, we see our children pouring their lives into their children. And, I mean, it is about sacrifice and giving up your life for somebody else. And that just <clears throat> isn't happening in this culture of death. In this culture of death, it's all about me, and we think that children are a right, and children are a gift. Nobody's promised a child. And so, you know, we need to be fruitful and multiply and to subdue this earth, you know. Right. It's important. Right. Right. Most of the grandkids love Nona, that's grandma, more than they love Babo, kind of daddy, but they get at different phases and stages where they're really enamored with the guy. And like right. this morning... One of our grandkids, Sienna, woke up and she said to her mom, where's Bobo? I loved it. And so she called me early this morning. She's about two years old. Yeah, at 7 o'clock. Very verbal. And she said, I love you, Bobo. <laughs> nice. I, I miss you, Bobo. So you know, that's good stuff. Doesn't yeah, get any better nice. than that. No, yeah. no, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Now, besides the ministry of <clears throat> having your own family and now grandkids, what else are you up to? Because you're doing this radio show, but again, it comes from a context that I'm somewhat familiar with. Tell us more about the kind of things that you're involved in. Well, you know, Joy and I served for years. I served as an Episcopal priest and, uh, and then reverted back home into the church. Now, when we married and served as and, a... And Joy, you are not a revert, you're a convert. I'm a convert. <clears throat> okay. But and I love being Catholic. You enjoying it? Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We're not playing Catholic. We're really Catholic. Yeah, we, we left right. a lot to come in to the church, and we, we love it and are serious about it joyfully. But we were involved right away in the ministry, in inner city ministry, uh, working in the area of racial reconciliation. We and, and our children in about a 95% African-American community. And we really felt like, you know, if we were to authenticate the faith, then black folks and white folks should be seen together, should worship together, should love one another, should live nearby you know, each other. And so that was kind of the basis of our ministry. For years we've done that. We continue to live in an African-American community. That was our pro-life work to begin with. And then we you know, heard more about the pro-life movement. Our fourth child, Wesley, we saw him on ultrasound, enjoys stomach. And it was just, I was just amazed when I saw him, you know, just sucking his thumb and moving around and I was pressing on Joy's stomach, God bless her, you know, and, 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 and yelling at, at my son in the womb and he would stop, you know, when he would hear my voice and when I was pressing on Joy, he would stop. And then I, I thought to myself, you know, I could kill you today. I can go to one of seven abortion mills in Birmingham and I could kill you. I wasn't going to do that, but I said, this is really happening. And so we got involved. We bonded with the preborn as well as the racial reconciliation work, but they all had the same root, the sacredness and the dignity of every human being that in the face of every person is the face of Jesus Christ in the womb and outside of the womb. So we've been very involved in lots of ministries. Joy's the executive director at our local crisis pregnancy center. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that, Joy. Well, um, I came on staff about a year and a half ago and um, it, we're the only pregnancy resource center in downtown Birmingham. So we are strategically placed between two of the last standing abortion mills in downtown Birmingham. 80% of our clientele are African-American. So after living 30 years in an African-American community, 
God puts us in a ministry where we're ministering to African Americans. And um, so it's really, you know, in the African American community, they make up 13% uh, of the population, but they're having 35% of the abortions. As a matter of fact, there's a, uh, I recently heard that the percentage of African American children aborted is about 60% mm -hmm. of the children conceived are aborted. Mm -hmm. And this is extraordinarily high. It is high. And, and not only are babies are being ab aborted, but women are being just, they don't know their value and their worth. And, and in the community I mean, and in the culture of death, but more prominent in the community, we're seeing each other as objects. And, and not the dignity of the person. And, and so girls are being used by guys, guys are using girls, and babies are the scapegoat um, for, the, for the usury. If, if, a, if a, a baby is conceived in that relationship, you know, it was just a hookup for the night. We're really not, I really didn't know him, it's just kind of like what we were doing, and, and so the baby becomes the scapegoat. And so we're there, mm -hmm. we're being light and salt into the community, loving what we're doing, beholding the face of God in every, all of our clients. And uh, we have great volunteers. It's a, a, a few paid staff people, but it's mostly have 30 volunteers of women and men who come down and volunteer their time. And we're also doing a lot of post-abortion healing work because the gospel of life is about being in radical solidarity with that baby, with the mother in crisis, and then those that have chosen abortion to bring healing to this incredible wound that's there. And so this has great implications for marriage. If you have 53 million abortions in our nation, approximately, how many women are affected? How many children are affected? How many men have been affected? How many grandmas, grandpas, and so on? So we're involved with ministries like Rachel Vineyard, and we have you know Bible study groups and, and healing groups. And, and then we talk to them also about relationship counseling. You know, if they're with somebody, where are you going to go in this relationship? You know, where's this headed? So we've seen some people get married and sexual integrity. And what do you want to do from this point? How's this working for you, having sex with multiple partners and so on? You want to try something different? So we're seeing some conversion there. And uh, so we're, we're busy in that way. And of course, uh, we do some counseling and, and other things. And I think it's very important that the issue of abortion is brought up in premarital counseling and in marriage counseling because it's having a great impact. Just pregnancy loss in general, abortion, miscarriage, stillbirth, the impact of those wounds on sexuality, intimacy, relationships, birthing children is a very important issue. As a matter of fact, this is something that's been very important for you because as I mentioned in the tease at the beginning of the program, uh, you also were sitting in for when we had our March for Life and our coverage of the March for Life. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, just observing it you know, and seeing what was going on. Of course, there's maybe 400,000 people there. I think some of the things that I took away from the time, just observing it, was the, the families, whole families that were there. And that there really is developed a pro-life spirituality for families. And just to see these families, to see the father with a child up on his shoulders, and really just very important that as a part of the pro-life movement now, families are really having a mission, how many priests we're seeing now that have gone into the ministry who were involved as youngsters in the pro-life movement. Um, there's a lot of negative impacts regarding abortion, but there's a lot of positive impact too. All the young people that are there, majority young people, that's very important because they're survivors. Anybody who's been born over the last 38 years is a survivor. And so how do you... I mean, in the sense that they, they were not aborted. They were not right. aborted. They were not so they, they survived the, mm -hmm. the onslaught. So how do you deal with that? Why am I alive? Right. Why wasn't I killed? And you really need an outlet. You, how can I put a stop to this? The speak up for life, be a missionary, the gospel of, of life, marriage, and family. Get out there. You know, walk for life. So I think there's, there's great hope. And so there's a positive impact on individuals and the family regarding abortion because they've really come forward and they've put you know, feet on their faith. And it's important because, you know, it's, it's a once a year, you know, we go out and we have this march, but then people get inspired and it's like, now I'm going to go back to my local community and I'm going to get involved. I'm going to get involved in my pregnancy resource centers. Right. I'm going to get involved in the 40 days for life that's happening in my city, you know, because it, it is a great rally in San Francisco and in Washington, but then what do we do when we go home? And so it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for people to get involved locally. Right. And as a matter of fact, we had a March for Life here in Birmingham mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, last summer. Yeah. 
You know that with, with Alveda King and, mm -hmm. and fa Father's Father life, Frank. And mm -hmm. Father mm -hmm. Frank Pavone was mm -hmm. there, and so on. So this is it's all the pro-life freedom rides, right? With pro -life Dr. Freedom Alveda, rides, with right. Dr. Alveda King, the niece of Martin Luther King, and she says this is the civil rights movement of our time. What's going on with the unborn? How could her uncle's dreams survive if we're killing the children? Right. She's post aborted herself, and this is really beautiful to see women. That was another big part of the march. You know, it's really reparations being made. They've come to grips with their abortion. They're not, not only forgiven, but they're becoming some of the most eloquent spokespersons, as John Paul II said, on behalf of life. Right. We're winning. Right, right, right. No, there's great momentum on the side for life. Now, one of the other things b besides, you know, being there to defend life, you're doing a lot of work with family. And, and counseling family and your radio show uh, right. because, again, you want a context for the life to grow. And family is the proper context for, right. for life. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your work uh, with family. Well, we have the radio show at home with Jim and Joy. And for uh, when we were in the pastoral ministry, we did premarital counseling. We did counseling. And so the radio show, people call in with all sorts of situations um, and where we get to counsel or refer um, somebody, you know, connect the dots for people. People who are in um, broken marriages, uh, lapsed Catholics, mothers who uh, children have left the church, all just sorts of situations where they call in and where we get to be hope and to say this isn't the end of the story, you know, and we can refer you on to another group where you hopefully you can get your marriage repaired, you can get your family restored, and, um, and just really love them compassionately. Um, because people will get on a radio show that will go all over the world and tell you their problem, yet neglect to go to their parish priest and tell them what's going on in their family, you know, and so because they need to be heard. Somebody needs to listen to them. And it, it's because their parish priest is so busy and they don't want to burden their priest with one more thing, you know. Right. I think, you know, one of the key things that I think the Lord uses us to do is to sort of fulfill what John Paul II says in Familiaris Consortio. And he says, you know, family become what you are. And I think what our nation needs and what people in marriages need is to remember. It's like they have amnesia like we've forgotten what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what marriage is all about. And John Paul II says, become what you are, which is a community of, of love and of life, because the Holy Trinity is a community of life and of love, one God in three persons, an eternal community of life and love, and that the family is to reflect the image and likeness of God, that, that people are supposed to see the Holy Trinity in, in our love and in our, in our family. What a holy calling. What power has been given to us in the sacrament. But people need to wake up. And I think our ministry, in part, is to turn the light on and to talk about the sacredness of the human person, to talk about do you understand what you are? Do you understand that Christ's love has been poured into you and you have a vocation to love and to reflect the Holy Trinity? And, of course, you know, we've heard those things or whatever, and, and you, you can do this in a sacramental marriage especially. And we pray with people to activate that within them. And I think just people need to understand how committed the Lord is to this and that life wins, marriage wins, and family wins. Don't be afraid in this culture of death. God is here for you. The Holy Trinity is with you. This is why you've been born, to complement one another, to bring forth children, to adopt children, and even while there's such an abortion mentality and culture and so many children, Lord have mercy, have died, the conservative people within in mainline churches and, and in the Catholic Church and among the Jews, non-Christian groups, Mormons, uh, they're having children. Somebody's having children. We're not going to die out as a species. And those who get to the future win. And so we just need to do what the Bible says what the church says, one man, one woman, loving one another, reverencing Christ in one another, welcoming children, be fruitful, multiply, fill the world, subdue it. You want to hear the pro-abortion industry scream? Just say, we're Catholics, we're evangelicals, and our plan is to have children. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the, one of the things that we definitely will do is outpopulate the atheists. Absolutely. Right. 
You know, it's just a matter of them trying to convince our children of their way of life. Right. But but we outpopulate them. We, we have more children than they yeah, this do. Is, this is like a fight. I think they're so lazy. I mean, to have a kid is a lot of work. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot yeah. that goes on. That's right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh-huh. and atheists are lazy. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems, you know, it's like you're in a fight with somebody and they're slitting their wrists as you're fighting them. Yeah. I mean, their philosophy, the way of thinking is, is it just has within itself uh, the seeds of its own destruction. We will prevail. The problem is not only the world and the culture. The problem is we're not being obedient to the culture of life, to the way of life, to welcoming children, to serving the church. So we need a renewal. We need a revival within the church. I think it's beginning to happen. You see that in the March for Life with these families, with these young people. So uh, in the midst of all of the, the sadness and the evil and the, as one friend of mine says, a tsunami of immorality, um, if the church just simply does what she's called to do, she has all the power to do it, and we know that we will prevail because Christ has died, he's risen, he's coming again for a bride, and he's bringing us into his family. One of the other things that I know that you do is talk about spirituality for marriage, for life, for interpersonal relationships in general. And you've done some segments on EWTN about this. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. We've had the privilege to do about 14 two-minute teachings for EW10 on marriage and God's plan, God's plan for marriage, a variety of teachings. And uh, they vary from God's vision for marriage to uh, a sacramental marriage to how to bless your children. Um, So there's all sorts of, of teachings that are there, but they really all get down to the fact of reverencing within one another Christ, not thinking, speaking, or touching your wife, your children, anyone without seeking the face of Christ. Understand that that Christ is between us. I have no right to think, speak, or touch my wife or anyone else or be in conversation with you without understanding the mediation of Christ. If we do this, it will transform our lives and our marriages. Yeah. Let's take a look at one of those clips now. We have one ready to go. Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Jim and Joy Pinto sharing with with you about marriage and God's plan. Marriage and family spirituality is sacramental. The family draws great strength and marriages draw draw in particular great strength from the sacraments of, of the church, from baptism, we become children of God, the sacrament of reconciliation and the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Eucharist and tasting and see that God is good. But we need to be aware as well that marriage is a sacrament. It's an outward and visible sign of Christ's love for the church. And it's a real proving ground of how we're doing in the other sacraments because we're face to face with our mate and we're to express that divine love that Christ calls us to. In marriage, when we did marriage counseling with premarital couples, I would say to them, you know, if you're not ready to give up half your life, don't get married. Because when we get married, we give up half our lives. When we have children, we give up the other half of our lives, and we are left with no life. But it is a sacrament in the dying to ourself that Christ becomes real, that he becomes strong in our spirituality, in our marriage, when I can die to myself, that I would prefer and honor Jim more than myself and also with my children. And then God is pleased. I could spend hours in prayer, have my quiet devotion. If I get up from that time and there is no transformation, God is saying, what did you just do? It needs to transform and change me. Good job, good job. So important, you know, just, uh, you know, the, the more you lift up, the more you speak about the family, uh, just the more power that that comes, and those of us, especially married, you know, within in the church, that we have everything we need in the sacrament of of marriage to fulfill the vows that we've taken, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish until we're parted by death. And again, I think we've got amnesia. We see so much of the culture of death. If we would but apply, and 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 let the Lord be the Lord within us. Uh, it's wonderful. Marriage and family is wonderful. We need to articulate this. Our children need to hear it. We need to be missionaries for marriage and the family. 
Are you enjoying doing all this stuff? I am. I really, really am. Um, the other night, uh, Jim's aunt called, and you know I'm, I'm a cancer survivor, and so a couple of years ago, how long, how long have you been cancer? Five free? years. Well, five yeah. years. To That's God great. be the glory, and um, and I am enjoying it because I get it. Life is short, and so I want to be obedient to what God's called us to do. Um, did I ever think I'd be the director of her choice? Did I ever think that I would be um, doing a radio show? No, none of those things were on my agenda. I was going to be a no nun, take care of the grandkids. But God has other plans, and it's being obedient to the season that we're in. I was a stay-at-home mom all my life. I love that life. But, you know, it changes. Life changes. And so it's just really being obedient to what God is doing in every new season of our life. Well, in a certain sense, being a stay-at-home stay at home mom can become a real school mm -hmm. and you've gone to your graduate school there you go i got my doctorate i hope yeah <laughs> i now, hope i learned something and now it's time to teach yeah and you know and one of the things that we taught and and that we're trying to really encourage couples and and with families is to pray together mm, every cool. single day to pray with i mean our kids at at 6.30, they were at the breakfast table. They had devotions, and we prayed every single day. And they didn't go out of the house without being blessed. And the same thing with our marriage. And you would be surprised how many people, good, solid, Catholic, Christian people, who don't pray together. And when we, when we neglect that, we give up a great power wow. in our life. God wants to participate with us fully in prayer, and we invoke the Holy Spirit into our life, that, that our flesh would die. My flesh won't die without the Holy Spirit. It lives really well unless God every single day is killing me. And, but I have to participate with that. I have to say, Lord, I surrender my will to your will. I get it. I'm not going to win. I learned that. That's what life taught me. And so it's just better to surrender to what God wants. And then I, when I do that, then he gives you the grace to surrender, the willingness to surrender. And you have trust and peace. You have immeasurable love. You're full of mercy. And you just turn out to be a pretty nice lady. But God does that. I mean, yeah. you know, hey, anything good in my life, to God be the glory. Anything bad, mea culpa. I take all the blame. I'm so glad I'm married to her. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> this is great. wonderful. That's really yeah. great. But she says, you know, this, this prayer, and it could just be 30 seconds or a minute just to speak a blessing, to meaningfully touch and to be there. A husband has power and authority over a wife that nobody else has upon the face of the earth, including the Pope or a priest or Mary, and all them can intercede for us. So, but nobody has the authority that I have with her. Same thing with her with me. When she prays for me in terms of healing, deliverance, power, n nobody has the authority like that. So take a minute, take two minutes, and we help people to know how to pray with one another spontaneously as well as in, in uh, you know, Catholic piety prayers. Right. Uh, and, and it's just amazing what a huge change could take place in such a short period of time if we would but be still and pray and bless the demons flee. Speaking of short periods of time, okay. I've got to take a break. Okay. But we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. We want to get your questions and your comments, so please call in. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, 
well, first of all, I would like to invite you to come here and join us on pilgrimage. If you have a chance to come down to Birmingham and make a pilgrimage here to EWTN and to the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament, we would love to have you. It's always a delight to have people come to our studio audience as well as to visit around the network. Uh, there are free tours of the network as well as, of course, the masses both here at the network and over in Hansville at the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament. And if you contact our pilgrimage department, they'll help you with all sorts of information. Uh, you can call them at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to the website www.ewtn.com. And they'll give you information about where you can stay and the scheduling and making sure that there's a place for you to be here in the studio. So come on down. You ready for some questions? Sure. All right, Great. let's start off with a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Father, I'm from Hickory Hills, out just outside of Chicago. I managed to fly in before the snow hit. Yeah, you're having some trouble flying back home. <laughs> That's for I'm sure. I'm afraid so. But uh, anyway, what can we, what's your question tonight? Well, one for Jim and one for Jim and Joy. Uh, Jim, you were a former Episcopalian priest, correct? Right. Um, as you know, the Church of England was the very first mainstream Protestant denomination at the Lambeth Conference in 1930 to officially approve of contraception. I've always been curious, what is their contemporary, their current position on the issue of abortion? That's my first question. And then a question for both of you. You indicated you've been at numerous pro-life rallies in Washington, D.C. and at least for me, my experience has been that the mainstream media either suppresses or distorts the actual number of participants in those marches. You mentioned 400,000 approximately at this year's march. Could you give us some ideas to how many people you believe have been at, let's say, marches in the last three to four to five years? Thank you, Father. Thank you. Look here. Go ahead, start off with the one about the uh, physical in church. Address him? Yeah, no, address me. Address you, okay. Um, well, I'll take the March for Life first, because okay. he did say, like, for the last several years or so. Yes. And uh, I'm quite sure that it's been 300,000 to 400,000 or more over the last several years. So this is nothing new, that we've had hundreds of thousands of people assembling, and it's nothing new that the media doesn't cover it, doesn't want to speak about it, and studies have been done on the media, their makeup, the majority of them, liberal, pro-choice. It's sort of like Mubarak's Egypt. They don't want any media coverage of the marches. <laughs> right. 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 So, but I want to encourage, you know, our, our questioner and those out there, uh, you know, who are wondering. It's amazing to get hundreds of thousands of people year after year, because they're not there for the media coverage, although we should get the media coverage. They're there because of their passion for life, because this has become more than an issue for them. I mean, they've encountered the preborn as our brother and sister, and as Christ within that mother. Uh, so we should be greatly encouraged by, by the numbers. Don't you yeah, that? I think the numbers are growing, and it is. it doesn't matter. It's not a cause. I mean, we do what we do, and I think people do what they do because they love Jesus. You know, it's not a cause. It's not, you know, like saving a whale or anything. It's not a cause. It, the whole thing is about, am I my brother's keeper? And whatever I do for the least of these, I truly have done unto Jesus. And so I, I, I think people really believe that. And so they have to show up and to say, I need to be counted. And, and my presence matters. And so much of the culture at this time and our future is really based upon hearing the cry. I mean, are we as, as women, as men, as masculine and feminine going to hear the cry of the weak and the helpless and respond, or are we going to continue to, to suppress that, abort our children? And some of the greatest pro-life people are people who have aborted and have repented, those who have forgiven much, love much. And, and these are people gathering by the hundreds of thousands, and, and locally there's marches and so on, because they, they've heard that cry. And it's like the Lord is, is coming with the Cain and Abel situation. Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the earth. You know, what have you done? What, what are you doing? Am I my brother's keeper? So they're coming out in mass. Regarding uh, the uh, Episcopal Church and where she stands at this time regarding abortion, I mean, I've been out for quite some time. 
but uh, a lot of it is England might have one position, America may have another, different dioceses have positions. But my experience in the Episcopal Church has been basically what it says in Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton, those, that, those joint decisions regarding abortion. Mm -hmm. And it's basically <laughs> that, uh, you know, they might, might say, well, in the difficult cases, you know, rape, incest, you know, we're not really, th those, th there's some questions about. Um, but uh, th their position is, in, in every case, even for health reasons, babies can be aborted for any reason. So basically what they take is the whole, the whole nine months that abortion is acceptable um, if you take into consideration the health issue in all these cases. So life of the mother, um, all of these issues really come down to what's going on with a woman's health. So even if they're not the hard cases, rape, incest, severe abnormality, if, if a woman's in a situation where she feels it's troubling her emotional health, her psychological health, these are reasons to have abortions. So they might say something like, well, there has to be health reasons in some of these cases. But when you define the health reason, it gets psychological, emotional, financial, your future in education, these are all affecting me, can I have an abortion? So it's very liberal within the Episcopal Church. And uh, I've learned a great deal within the Episcopal Church that's positive. It has a great heritage. And they, they vote on moral points such as, as you know, homosexuality and, and abortion. The Catholic Church doesn't vote on these things. We can't change these things. These have been given to us by Christ and by, by the early church. We've just accepted them. Um, so uh, it's, it's open season on babies in the Episcopal Church. Uh, okay. We have a call. In, uh, Rich, are you there? Yes. Hi, where are you from? Hi, Father. How are you doing? Yeah, uh, Rich from Connecticut. Hi, Great. Joy and Jim. How are you? Hi, Rich. I have a... Um, I'm sorry? You just said hi. <laughs> I have a... I have a... Um, it's difficult to, to pick you up. I, I have my TV on mute. I have a... Uh, Arlene and I are married 40 years, and I have a couple of comments, but I'd like you to also elaborate on a couple of other things, uh, comment more. I... Well, we, ha we have one son... Um, who, after being married 40 years, 13 years ago or so, he took his final vows with the CFRs, Father Rochelle's group. He's living now in the South Bronx. And the night before he took his vows, I had called him, and I said, gee, son, he was dating, and he was nearly engaged to a, a beautiful, and if I thought if there was any woman that was right for my son, it was her. And I, and I just said to him, son, uh, are, you, are you in love with, with that I won't say her name on TV and get her permission, but are you in love with her? And he said, Dad, I am, but I, and I love her tremendously, but I love God more, and I trust God more. So it's, it's a thing I think we've lost in this society. We don't trust our wives, and we just, this whole cynical society, we've lost that trust, and we just don't rely on Jesus Christ and God. And he felt, it was 15 years later now, and he he just feels totally comfortable. He just came back from Haiti, and we were scared because we, I, I just said, of all the assignments, you know, and I told him, watch for cholera, as we do every time he goes on a, an assignment, watch for cholera, watch for malaria and AIDS when he's in Africa. And his, his total trust, he just says, Mom, Dad, don't worry, it's, I, I'm in the hands of God. And he, and he just teaches us a whole lot. So if you can just elaborate, maybe, and I'm not sure, I don't have all the answers for marriage. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so basically trying to deal with the issue of needing to trust more. Yeah. What I heard, if I understand it correctly, uh, it, his son's been able to abandon himself in trust to the Lord in his ministry, and that, that there's a parallel there to, to marriage. You know, you can't be half in. You can't be 95% into marriage because the other 5%, it's going to win. Something's going to infiltrate it. You know, you go for the weakest link or chink in the armor and go for it. And, you know, marriage is really about that. I think, I think the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their communion of love and life are totally abandoned to one another. They don't go around talking about themselves. You know, the Father speaks about the, the Son. The Son speaks about the Father. The Holy Spirit speaks about Jesus. They're, they're abandoned to one another in Christ, the service to others. And, and you know, I, I don't wait for joy to be abandoned for me, my whole thing is how do I facilitate God's plan for her life? 
How do I lay down my life? Like John Paul II said, he pointed to the crucifix and said, behold your groom. Behold your groom. For the whole church, male and female, he's our groom. Look at him upon the cross. Look at his abandonment. He doesn't tithe his love. He gives it all. And that's what we have to do. We can't be half in. And that's the whole idea of total gift of self. I think that's, if he wasn't saying that, I'm saying it. <laughs> you know, there has to be abandonment in marriage. You know, right. I'm not half in. I'm totally sold out you know, for her. And that's her. the way that you express the trust. Right. And, you know, when we got married, you know, two weeks after we got married, we left and went to seminary. I left father, mother, sister, brother, everybody, because he was my husband and, and we were one. And I trusted First of all, I trusted Jesus, and then I trusted Jim. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it forever. <laughs> I mean, and I, I trust him. Like he said, he wakes up in the morning, and he wants to facilitate God's plan for my life. I wake up in the morning, and it is my ultimate desire to fulfill God's plan for his life. Now, it's a mystery how the, by the end of the day our needs get met. But I don't wake up in the morning and say, well, I have this need, and I have this need, and you just better meet it. You know, I mean, it, it's a mystery. What By laying down our life, you get your life back, but you got to be willing to lose it. Yeah. And that's the trust. And I, I believe he wants the best for me, and he believes I want the best for him, you know, and, so that's, and that's trust. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have another caller named Joe. Hello, Joe. Hi. Uh, Hi, where I are was, you from? I was wondering, I have a question for jo, Jim and Joy Pinto. Um, I was wondering if the Blessed Virgin Mother or one of the saints um, brought them back to the church and how they rely on them, and uh, could they explain how they feel about the Blessed Virgin Mother and all the saints? Well, I'll talk about that. Um, in our Episcopal church, in, uh, we had a picture of Mary, and she sat in, uh, she was on the front wall, and I was in the front pew. And while Jim was really journeying back to truth and authority. Um, we have this beautiful picture of Mary and me being in the front pew. I think Mary would going like this to me. And I would look at this picture and I would pray, you know, like, what is this about? Who is this Mary? And um, Because you didn't grow up with much no, of a sense of Mary. No, I was Protestant. I was protesting Mary, you know, and... Um, and so to have this discovery, and I started to pray. I mean, I went to a, a Catholic priest because one time in my quiet time, Jesus introduced me to his mother. Usually it's the other way around. But Jesus said to me in my quiet time, my mother can help you. So I didn't know what to do with his mother. I don't know, huh? So it's like, what do I do with your mother? So I went to a Catholic priest and I said, you may find this strange, but I was in my quiet time in a very broken moment, crying out to the Lord, uh, totally unrelated to his journey, just a whole nother broken moment in our life. And um, I went to the Catholic priest and I asked him, what was I supposed to do with Mary? Well, I had, how, well, Jesus wants me to know her. And all along this journey of my surrendering and all along the journey still, even being Catholic, Jesus continues to introduce me to his mother. And it's such a beautiful discovery. I love her. I mean, I, I absolutely love her. And I look forward to loving her more as he continues to introduce me to her, the woman of God that she is. As part of my reversion, right, so I was baptized Catholic, wandered away from the church for like 30-something years, and then came back into the church. So she's a convert. I'm a revert. I came back to the church. In my pro-life work, I did a number of sit-ins or rescues. So I would sit in front of abortion mills, and as the girl was coming in, I wouldn't move so that they could try and rescue that girl and that baby. And I, I went to jail for this numerous times, and one time spent time in solitary confinement for about 17 days in Wichita, Kansas, for trying to rescue babies. And it was while I was in there as an Episcopal priest, and it was just very quiet in a little cell. Uh, my mom passed away when I was five years old. And God was just dealing with me about it. I was thinking about my mother. And, and uh, I felt like the Lord was saying to me, what do you think mothers do who are dying and they have a five-year-old? I said, well, what do they do? And, and it was like the Lord said, they pray and they weep and they consecrate their children to God. And that's what your mother did for you. 
And I thought he was saying something about the rosary, that about Mary and about the rosary. She prayed the rosary because she's she stayed in the Catholic Church. I left. And I said, well, the rosary. And it was through that encounter that I started to get more interested in, in Mary and in the rosary. And perhaps my mother prayed for me. And so I think Mary in that way, in union with my mother, uh, helped to bring me back home to the church. Okay. We have John on the line. Hello, John. Hi, Hi where are you from? Ohio. Great. And what's your question? For, well, for Jim and Joey, maybe you'd want to comment. First of all, that gentleman from Connecticut, uh, I thought I was going to be a religious, and I've been a secular Franciscan 16 years, and I've been married 22 years. God gave me everything. If he's really in love with that gal, you know, that's a cause for prayer. Anyhow, my <laughs> questions are, uh, the first one is, how can you draw a woman away from abortion in your ministry? Do you use ultrasounds? And the second one is very important, especially for Catholic men. How do you get people to get Jesus Christ number one in their life, uh, including the African-American community? And I'll hang up. Okay, I'll answer the first part. You can answer the second. Um, and what we do is we, are, we train our counselors. So we have a method of counseling that we go through with our clients. We have clients who come in who are abortion-minded. Mm -hmm. We have girls who are in a crisis pregnancy who were scared, confused, um, and afraid, and really hopeless. And so it is our mission to bring them truth, hope, and love, and, um, and the abundant, extravagant mercy of Jesus. And to tell every girl in our center when she comes in and she's, she feels bad about herself already, the last thing we need to do is to condemn or anything. And we affirm the essence of her being and tell her that she is good, mm. no matter what, that she is good. And the unplanned baby inside of her is good, and it's a gift from God, and it's not a mistake. And so then we counsel with them, go through all their obstacles, everything that they think they need to have the abortion. And then they have ultrasounds. So we have an ultrasound. The Knights of Columbus um, bought us a brand new ultrasound machine. And uh, the National Knights and the State Knights of Alabama went in together and we have a beautiful uh, brand new ultrasound machine. And so they get to hear their baby's heartbeat and see their baby. 80% um, of the girls choose life. But there is a percentage of girls who have heard the heartbeat, have seen their baby, and I will say to them, I've done everything I could do. I'm just the conduit of truth and hope and love. And it's God's. I can't, I can't change a person's heart. I can't convert somebody. That's God's plan. And so I, we pray. So we have a chapel in our center, and we pray and, um, and, and let it go. And there's nothing else we can do. And... Um, it, but they have the right in the United States of America to kill their baby. It's not morally, it's not ethically right, but it's their right. The good news is that abortion mills in our country have gone from about 2,000 to about 748. And the crisis pregnancy <laughs> centers or pregnancy resource centers have gone from you know, several hundred to almost 3,500. So we're not unique at all. And we bless all of those crisis pregnancy centers, pregnancy resource centers, because they really are communities of love. They really are an extension of the church on the front lines. And when girls come into this place, if they can feel a community of love and that you're not alone, and again, we wake them up and say, be what you are, you know, uh, that, that it just helps so very, very much. The, the second part, you know, about what can we do for, for, for people and, and becoming pro-life and, and marriage. You know, I, I, I left the church, the Catholic church, many years back. And as I reflected upon it, why did I leave the church? I was born again by water and the spirit in baptism. But the problem was this, I wasn't converted and I was still in the church. You need ongoing conversion. We need to make commitments. And that's a problem with a lot of people in, in churches. They're there. Yes, they're children of God by, by baptism. But we've got to understand that by faith, we need to embrace, even as the Jews are, you know, are bar mitzvahed, uh, circumcised as, as little boys, and then they own the Torah. So we, in confirmation, 
or in other times in our lives, we need to be converted. So, so the deal is this, we need to pray for conversion, we need to be living godly lives, we need to invite these guys and, and other people into a community of love, and they need to be converted in context in the midst of the culture of death, and they need to repent, we need to know how to pray with people, to meet the Lord, to renew their faith. I'd say 95% of the girls and guys that come into to our uh, Pregnancy Resource Center, I, I've rarely met anybody who's not a Christian. These are our sons. These are our daughters. These are our nieces. These are our nephews. If the churches would stop aborting their children, this thing would come to a grinding halt. These aren't people who don't have faith. And so I say to them, uh, you know, we do all this teaching and the ultrasound and we talk about abortion. But then if I say, hey, you, are you a Christian? You oh, yeah, I'm baptized. I'm in... I'm in this church, that church. I said, do you understand that Jesus was an embryo, was a fetus, and now reigns as Lord? That, that Christians, since over 2,000, don't kill their offspring. Do you know, you know and, and that you're a Christian, you've been baptized. You know, come home to the faith. Can I pray with you? Yeah, let's pray. So I think it's a matter of conversion. It's a matter of renewal. It's a matter of awakening and turning the light on. And we need to be on, on fire, you know, for the Lord. I'm thinking of Cardinal, was it Arenzi? Cardinal right. Arenzi? Somebody asked him, how did you become a priest? And Cardinal Arenzi said, I sat around priests before I was a priest, and they were on fire, and I got so close, I caught on fire. <laughs> we need marriages and family and a people of life that are so on fire that this culture will catch on fire. Let's go to another call. We have Kava on the line. Hello, Kava. Hi, Father. This is Hava. I'm in Sugar Land, Texas, and my husband and I pray the Holy, Ra uh, Holy Land Rosary with you every morning. Oh, I hope you say Hail Mary for me now and again. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, my question or my comment is for the Pintos, and I corresponded with Mr. Pinto online. I'm Jewish. My husband is Baptist, and we are in RCIA right now, and he was sending me words of encouragement. And then he told me about the faith prayer, and they sent me a copy of the faith prayer. And my husband and I say it every morning, and I'm an elementary school teacher, so you could guess that mm -hmm. there are situations that come up all the time where I can lose it. And I just kind of bring that face prayer and just, like, try to look at my students, my husband, anybody, you know, without, I don't look at them without first seeing the face of Christ in them. And it has just made a change in me and how I react to things. It's, it's made a change in my husband. And my question, more or less, is, how can I spread the word of the face prayer? Because it is just so beautiful and, and so life-changing. And I'll hang up now. <laughs> all right, first, so first of all, this face prayer yeah. uh, is something that you two composed. Yeah. Um, and I'd like you to lead it. We have only about four minutes okay. left. I'd like you to lead us in it. But tell us just real briefly uh, what this face prayer is about. Face prayer is about acknowledging intentionally the reality that Christ is mysteriously with and in somehow, some way, every human being, that as you do it unto the least, you do it unto me. That's true whether you agree to that or not. Christ is there. The thing for us is to have a way where we are intentionally abiding by that and reverencing that so that each day we pray this prayer so that we would not look at another, think of another, or speak to another person without seeking the presence of Christ. Seek my face, your face, Lord, I'm seeking. Now, whether it's the literal face of Christ that we're going to see or just his presence that we're acknowledging, I have no right, since I am a Christian, to deal directly with my wife, with my children, my grandchildren, with you, my friends, my enemies, because Christ is between us. When I became a Christian, born again by water and the Spirit, I gave up my right to deal directly with people. And so the, the face prayer, would you like to pray it? Yes. Yeah, it goes like this. You, please. We pray it each day. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, I embrace your grace this day so that, that I might not think of another, speak to another, or touch another without, without first looking for your face in the other. other. I ask all this through Jesus Christ, God, God incarnate, God with skin, God, God made poor, God, God with a face. face. Amen. Amen. So it's, it's a prayer, but it's a lifestyle. And believe me, I know when I'm living in that prayer and I know when I'm not. Because I couldn't think or have said what I said to my wife. Then I say, you know, I, I haven't, I'm not living that prayer. So this prayer is on our website, jimandjoypinto.com, jimandjoypinto.com. And people can get it for free if you would just go to the website and register for it. And, and then You'll send them a little card? We'll mm -hmm. send them the actual prayer card. 
and uh, they can start praying it on their own. They can pray it with their husband. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a pro-life spirituality for marriage, for the family, for everyone, that we not only have a mission to end abortion, but it's a lifestyle not to think, speak, or touch anyone without reverencing Christ because we're going to be, we're going to be accountable okay. before God. Well, thank you both thank very you. much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, it's gone by very quickly, but uh, yeah. the hour is about up. It's been wonderful. So thank you very much, and thank you for pitch hitting uh, <laughs> at, at, at this, uh, uh, this short notice. And may Almighty God bless you and let his face shine upon your face to lead you in all of his ways by his peace. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, you know, we can bring you Jim and Joy and all the other guests who come here, plus all the other programs that we have on EWTN and the radio, because this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible. And so we need you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill because we've got our bills to pay too. And so if you do that, we'll be able to pay those bills and keep bringing more programs to you. God bless you and thank you.